the word I want to give you this morning, I need you to hear. And listen, listen to what the Holy Spirit wants to say this morning. Again, he's not speaking to the sinners. Again, he wants to speak to his children, to his people. And it's quite a, it's quite a strong message again. It's quite a strong message again. So I want you to, to get all your thoughts together and leave everything behind of the, what's happening outside these walls. It's now, we had time for the, the, the whole week. We had time to do whatever we like and whatever we want to do. And this is the, the norm of the church today, is just to give God this hour or two. Uh, we are not being taught to walk a daily life with God, but we've been taught Sundays. We go to church and that's the only time that God has. So I'm asking you, while we're in that parameters, we function in that parameters, I want your attention now this morning to what God wants to say to you. Some people might experience rebuke. Some people might experience confirmation. Some people might experience uh, uplifting. But whatever you experience this morning, and you know, while I was sitting and waiting on the Lord this morning here in front, the Lord said to me this thing. You must understand quickly this. He says, if you are getting something here with us in, this, in the church that's irritating you to you, now listen to me, even if it's me, <laughs> God says it's easy to pump your, your what's cater? Calves, to pump them up 10 bar, blow up like a bullfrog and walk out the door and find yourself another church. But the Lord says that that's not the way for you to grow. He says when you're feeling irritated about something, you need to go and check your own life. Why are you feeling irritated? Because obviously, I'm pushing on a button that, that is very sensitive. And guess what? It's not my button, it's yours. So you need to find what button it is in your life before you blow up like a bullfrog, run out the door, and then it's goodbye. No. If you want to please God, then you need to find that irritation in your life and sort it out. Simple as that. All right, that's not the message. <laughs> no. I want you to open your Bibles for me in the book of Jonah. And we're going to read uh, chapter 1, just a few verses. And I'm going to jump a few verses. And everybody, is it's a well-known scripture, so everybody knows the... What's a different story about for story? I hate the word story. Parable. No, it's not a parable. History. Let's change it with history. Everybody knows the history of Jonah. Hopefully. All right, if you don't, you, go and read the whole, you can go and read the whole book. It's only four, four, four chapters long. All right, Jonah. One for, as verse... From verse 1. He says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Imitai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah, now listen, I want you to read this, this verse 3 very carefully. He says, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarsus, from, listen to what he's fleeing from. He's fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarsus. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. Now I want you to jump to verse 11 for me. I want to show you quickly what was the consequences of his decision. There's consequences of after every decision that we made. He says, the verse 11. He says, then they, now that's the people on the ship. Let me quickly explain to those who doesn't understand. Now when Jonah went onto the ship and everything went haywire, there was a big storm and the ship wanted to sink and they, over, they threw everything overboard to, to make the, the weight of the ship lighter, but the storm didn't stop and Jonah knew exactly what he was, who was talking to him. 
Jonah knew exactly who was, who was the guilty party. And listen what he said to them. He said, verse 11, then, now the people say, speak to him first. He says, then they said unto him, what shall we do unto thee that the sea may become unto us? For the sea wroth and was temptuous. And he said unto them, listen what his answer was. Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea become unto thee. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. For I know what the, the purpose is for the storm. How many times has God spoken to you? Okay, by the way, I'm just speaking to you about your decisions this morning. The consequences and your decisions. How many times have we made a choice and a decision in life? Like Jonah, God is speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking to us regarding certain things in our life. And we choose to run. We choose to run from his presence. We choose to disobey his commandment. We choose to disobey his spirit. We choose to disobey what he commanded us to do. Then all things go wrong in our life. And guess who's to blame? Satan. Satan is attacking me and Satan is destroying my life. Satan this and Satan. No, my friend, let me tell you quickly. I've got bad news for you once again this morning. It's not Satan. <laughs> it's you. It's you that's causing it. Listen to what Jonah said to them when they asked him, what must we do with you? Will you... Quickly get yourself into this picture. If you are guilty of anything in your life, what will you do to fix it? What did Adam do? When something happened, when, 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 when they, all of a sudden they found themselves naked because of the sin that they committed, what did he do? He blamed. He blamed the blame game. He says, God, it's that wife, that stupid wife you gave me that misled me. God came to Eve and Eve said, no, it's that stupid Satan that misled me. No, it's not. It's not. Yes, Satan was there to, mis to, to mislead you, but you made the choice to listen. You made the decision to follow. You made the decision to be guilty of sin. Jonah, you made the, 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 the choice to run away from God's presence and from what God commanded you to do. You, Mr. Jonah, you ran away. My question is, what will you do still? What will you do if you know you're guilty in a circumstance? Will you act like Jonah and say, now you must remember they are in the sea, deep sea. I don't think Jonah had any hope of being saved. All he knew is he needed to save them and he needs to die. But you see, God had different plans. You see, God will just shake the sea and your boat in your life to get you off that boat, to get back. And whatever means he's creating, he will create. I think, don't think Jonah expected a great feast. And please, though it's not a whale. I don't know where people get these funny stories from. It's an apple in the garden. And a, no, it's not. It, the Bible just called it the fruit, and the Bible called just this a big fish. It's not a whale, it's not a fish, it's just a big fish. God sends a big fish as a taxi for Jonah. Pick him up and take him to the land. But you see, in this return, that's just what we don't understand. Our, our decisions had very, very serious consequences for us. You must go read the passage further. When Jonah ran, he was on the ship, the sea gone rough, and they threw him overboard because he knew he was guilty. And what happened? The sea became calm. Now Jonah was 
Just get this picture in your mind. Jonah was floating. Help, 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 help. I wonder if he could swim. Floating there in the deep of the sea. There's no, nothing. And all of a sudden, he's like, whoop, this big fish swallow him. I think he thought he was, it's now finished. I became breakfast or supper or whatever it was. But you see, on his way back, something also happened. You see, he made the choice to run away. But on his way back, the Bible says he sat. Now, a lot of people are, are, are have a, a lot of nonsense to say about the scripture. And really, it's really a bunch of nonsense. The Bible says he called out of death. Now they say he died. And God resurrected him again and all this nonsense. No. When he called out of death, means he was sitting in the stomach of a fish and it was stinking. He was there, he was in the death where everything died and everything was rotten. But he didn't die and became bait himself and then God, God raised and resurrected him again. Nonsense. But in that stinking situation, the Bible says he cried out to God because he acknowledged that he was wrong. He acknowledged but still he didn't know he was in a taxi. He thought he became breakfast or supper. I mean, maybe that's why he cried out to God. Oh, please don't let me become breakfast or supper. But Saint, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll become. I'll, 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 obey. I'll obey. Just save me. But you see, he had to endure that stink. That death period. If you're going out of the will of the Father, you're not just stepping into, back into it. It's taking a while. And in that while, a lot of things can go wrong. And a lot of things you will have to endure. Please, and it's not Satan attacking you. It's because you went out of the will of the Father. Now you have to repent and you have to endure whatever it is that he's bringing, that listen to me, that he is bringing in your way, in your life, to endure so that you will be come back and be saved. Don't think you can disobey God and tomorrow you can still step back and, okay, Lord, sorry I'm here. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Do you know God works on numbers? Number three, number seven, 40. That's God's numbers. And mostly, he will work in either the three, hopefully not on the 40, but either the three or the seven years in your life for you to return back to his will. Child of God, I'm speaking to you, you must understand this is serious stuff. This is serious stuff. People are experiencing all kinds of things in their life that go wrong and then they want us to pray and rebuke and 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 chase satan and you want to know whatever we even we, let me go not go there it's not satan that we have to rebuke it's you mr and mrs that went out of the will of the father and now he's taking the long road back to his world I can see some of you can testify what I'm speaking about. I can see the hands, the faces are, yeah, I know that. That part of the life, I've, I've experienced that. I had the encounter with a fish, and I had the encounter with death, and I had the encounter with a stinking situation. Yes, you know what I'm talking about. That's why I said to you, some of you might find it encouraging, some of you might, might find it a rebuke. But whatever you experienced this morning, wow, just, ex just open your ears and hear what God wants to tell you as his child. It's quick to disobey. Jump on the ship and go. Your own direction. Your own way. And you think, listen to me, I want to emphasize this. And you think you can run away from my God. You can't. Ecclesiastes says, he says, where will I hide? If I go into death, you are there. If I go up and climb the heaven, you are there. doesn't matter where you, there is no place you can hide from my Father. Nowhere. 
And guess what, my friend? I'm going to use, don't, and don't, don't quote me, say I'm, I'm saying God is a bloodhound. Please, I'm not. But he, he, he can be like a bloodhound if he smelled your blood and he wants you. Remember last Sunday, he says, I'm a, I'm a jealous God. So if he smelled you and he wants you, he will pursue you and he will go through walls. He will go, he will move mountains, but he will get to you. Especially if you've got a minister or a calling on your life and you're in disobedience. He will follow you. He will seek you. Yes, he will rebuke you. He will cause the storms and that everything will fall apart. That you can realize that you've been disobedient and you have to come back. Like I said, in this journey back, you will experience, not might, you will experience death. Not death like people dying around you. Circumstances, situations. You will, it will smell around you. And please don't seek Satan in the situation because Satan is not even close by. He's not even there. But you need to seek is like Jonah. When he was in the circumstances of death, stink, rottenness, no hope. What did he do? He didn't rebuke Satan. He didn't seek Satan. No, he seek the Father. You see, too many of us is seeking Satan. Too little of us is seeking the Father. Maybe you must start seeking the Father more than you seek Satan. Like I said last Sunday. Many of us is pursuing the blessing instead of the blesser. Stop pursuing your blessings and pursuing the blesser because when you pursue the blesser and you find him, Matthew 5, 6 verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then it, the blessing will come. Don't seek the blessing, seek the blesser. Jonah is sitting in this death and he didn't, Try to get away out of this mouth or trying to be like, what is that guy? MacGyver. He didn't try to be a MacGyver to find his way out. No. He realized, he knew where his help, what is the King David says, where my help comes from. He knew he had to repent. He knew he had to seek the Father's face because he knew it was only the Father that can save him now. If God gives you an instruction, my friend, listen to me. I don't care how obscure it might look. I don't care what you will experience. How you think it's, oh, no, I can't do this. How you, whatever you might think or imagine, I don't care what you think. Obey. Obey. Let me give you an example. A friend of mine. His name was Domini Herman Ace. He died, I think, two years ago now. And he was in Cape Town on a, on a, on a business trip. And he, he says he walked into this little, this little cafe. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him because there was an Indian girl behind the counter. And the Holy Spirit sp spoke to him, telling him, oh, he must tell her that Jesus loves him. And he's like, okay. He said to her, Jesus says, I need to tell you that he loves you. He turns around, he walks out, and got in his car, and he left. That's all he did. There was no fireworks, brimstone, no repentance, nothing. That's all he did. A year later, he went back, and he finds himself at this little, the same little shop, but he can't remember what he did last year. I mean, can you remember that what you did last year in a little shop? No, he can't. So as he walks in, there's this Indian girl there, and when she saw him, her face lit up. And he's like, wow, all right? So he came close and she says, I don't know who you are. And I don't know if you can remember me. But a year ago, you stood right in front of me. And you told me that Jesus loves me. She says, I was in that week. I was seeking which God was the true God. I was seeking a God that could speak to me. 
she says, and here you come. And you give me a message from your God that says that he loves me. And that is exactly what I wanted. I, I was waiting on an answer. How many times did we disobey God's will? And some of those times that those opportunities that we disobeyed, people are today find themselves in hell. People are struggling because the church is not doing his, his duty. It's not listening to the Holy Spirit. It's not following. It's not being led by the Holy Spirit anymore because we're being led by some other false stuff. Prosperity. If you seek money in this world, you won't find Jesus. Let me tell you straight away. <laughs> if you seek prosperity and if you follow prosperity, you will not find my Jesus. Because prosperity is there and Jesus is there. Because you're seeking, go and read Matthew 6, verse 31 and 2 and 3. Go and read it for yourself. Maybe just put it on the board. Let them read it, please. You will see, the, what does the Bible say? Who's seeking after prosperity? It's not the children of God. Jesus himself said, after these things, a specific people, a group of people seek. Read it, verse 31. Matthew 6, 31 to 33. Because our aim, our focus is differently. We think we know better than God. We think when God sends us with a, with, to, to commission us, we think we can do better. We can do it somewhere else. You can't. You won't. I can promise you, you will fail in whatever attempt you do in life. If it's not God's will, and if that doesn't God have God's approval, you will, I can promise you, you will fail. As a child of God, not as a, as a sinner. Satan, look after his children. If you want to obey God, you have to obey Him in all. Not certain things, in all. It starts with your own life. Righteousness. His kingdom. Everybody raise their, raise their hands now when I ask who wants to draw closer. If you want to draw closer, you have to lay down all the junk in your life. The cleaner you become, the closer you'll become. You don't come into the presence of God and think you can, hey, Otopi. Hey, you old man. You old man. My God will laugh at you, man. Because he's the creator of all. He's holding the whole universe. All of this, everything that's existing is in the palm of his hand. Don't toy around with my God. My God is nobody's fool. He's nobody's playmate. My God is a holy God. And when my God speaks, the world trembles. If it suits God to throw you overboard because of your disobedience, He will do so. But be assured, you will not drown. He will save you. Because He's got, he's got a purpose for your life. He's got definitely a purpose for your life. You will not drown. You will not perish you will be saved i don't know how i don't know where and i don't know when but all i can tell you is you look up to heaven and ask him for help and he will come and save you but then you need to seek his face and not run from his presence stop running from his presence start running to him because the protection and the savior is in him and by him not far from him if you want to be saved, run to him, not away from him. So what have you done in your life that you disobey God? And then all things start falling apart. And you start questioning. Listen now, the questions. What have I sinned? What have I done wrong? Oh, God doesn't love me anymore. How can he prove it? How can such a loving God cause this in my life? Oh, yes, he can. 
Because it's not his love that's causing it, it's his righteousness that's causing it. You see, we all want to believe God is only one-sided. No, he's not. He doesn't have just one face. He doesn't have a face. He doesn't just have a face of, of, of love. No, he's got a face of righteousness as well. If you want to please my God, you will have to submit under his authority. If you want to be blessed, you have to submit under his rulership. Obey his word. Not only the Old Testament or not just the New Testament, all of it, from cover to cover. Obey. Stop with your arrogancy. Stop being arrogant towards my God. Let the fear of the Lord. You know what? That's the problem. The church doesn't have the fear of the Lord anymore. We think we can pray and treat him the way we like. And I saw someone on Facebook yesterday writing, or writing something like, in whatever circumstances, it is, they've got this whole story, and then the lion of Judah will roar. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, do you understand what you're saying? When the lion of Judah must roar, this whole world will shake in his foundations. Where do I find it? Go and read it. It's also in the Bible. Where Moses came down from the mountain. They just came out of Egypt. And God came down the mountain to speak to his people. And his voice was so tremendous that the people were fearful and they said to Moses, no, 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 no. You speak to God on our behalf. We, we can't hear that voice. Go and read it. And the people were fearful of God because of what, how he sounded like when he spoke to his people. If you hear God really hear his voice, you will tremble. You will not play hide and seek with him anymore. You will not play games with him anymore. You won't blame him for things anymore. You won't blame him for all the things that go wrong in your life. No, you will rather find the fault within you. Let me tell you, my God is blameless. He's perfect. No sin, no mistakes. All the mistakes and sin is with us. But don't blame my God for the things that go wrong in your life. If you made the choices and the seasons in your life, and now today you have to bear the consequences of it, guess what? You will have to bear the consequences of your own decisions. But, and yes, it's a big but, if you repent, if you seek His face, He will save you. He will. It's a promise. He will. Come and save you. But these two things must happen. First, I have to repent of number three. Sorry, there's three things. I have to acknowledge I've sinned. I have to repent and I have to seek his face. For too long, we are blaming Satan for everything that's going wrong in our lives. Because we don't have the spirit of discernment. If you had the spirit of discernment, you would understand Satan is not close to by or close by. He's not even in your proximity. He's somewhere else. He's busy somewhere. But he's not with, busy with you. Maybe you must just open your ears and say, Lord, where have I gone wrong? What have I done against your will and your spirit and your, and, and your, and your, and your law? What have I done wrong? You hear the word law. No, but Jesus came to break all the... Yes, but he never came to break the Ten Commandments. God's law is still God's law. Jesus never fulfilled the Ten Commandments because if he broke those ones, then God is a, is a liar. And the Bible says he cannot lie. So the Ten Commandments is still active today because that's God's personality. It is, it is attributes. Are you suffering today in consequences because of the of, of decisions that you made? Are you blaming God? Because of your wrong turns, decisions that you've made. I'm here to tell you today, if your world is shaking and you don't know where to go to, 
it's okay to fall overboard. Because when you fall, you will fall into his hands. But then you have to repent. Acknowledge, repent, and seek his face. And I can promise you, my God, who never failed, who has never failed, and who can never fail, will save you. Exactly from where you are. Where you find yourself, even where you sinned, he will forgive you, and he will take you back for his purpose, for his name's sake. What is the end of Jonah's mission? The end was a whole city. The Bible calls it a great city was saved due to one man's obedience. And you know what? If you read that, if you read that, that, that history of, 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 uh, of Jonah very carefully, I want you to, there's a few things I want to emphasize to you. The Bible says when Jonah went to speak to the king, number one, the king heard him. Number two, the king obeyed. Number three, the king reacted. What was it? The king was waiting for God to speak to him. He was ex his word, God's word. He was waiting for the word of God to accept it with joy. And listen what this king did. This king went. This king went and he went and he, and he, and he announced a day of, of mourning over the whole city of Nineveh. And you know how sorry he was. Listen to what he did. The Bible says he was so grieved. And he was so obedient to what the prophet of God, Jonah, came to tell him. That he even went and told his people to cover the animals with a garment of mourning. Even the animals were covered. The world out there is waiting for you to tell them about the good news that Jesus, and it's good, the good news is not that they're, going, that they're going to hell, please. That's not good news. That's sad news. But the good news of Jesus Christ is, is that Jesus still saves, Jesus still heals, and Jesus still delivers. That's the good news. And are you and I those witnesses out there in the world? Let me ask you a question that the Holy Spirit asked me a couple of years ago. I don't know what, I was in the circumstances and I was in a struggle with the Lord and the Holy Spirit came to me and he says, there was 5,000 people that was following Jesus on a daily basis. How many is following you? Like, oh boy. And I want to ask you that question. How many people is following us because we are the witnesses of the Lord? How many? How many disciples does you and I have that we've made? People that we've led to Jesus. People that we brought to repentance. How many is there in the world that can say, I have met Jesus through this, this and this person? And how many verses equals, how many people are lost because of our lack of testimony? How many people is today forever lost because they died? Forever. Have you ever thought about the, the concept forever? Every time I hear of someone that someone died, the first question in my heart is, Lord, did they know you? Because now it's too late. Forever. Never have a chance again to say, Jesus, forgive me. Never. It's too late. Can you and I accept that responsibility before God not to tell someone that Jesus loves them? That Jesus can forgive them? That Jesus can change their lives? Do you, are you willing to take that, that responsibility before the Lord and be accountable for every soul that we are not speaking to? Every brother and sister in the church that you're not warning, the Bible says, if you see your brother's sin, you need to warn him. Do you do that? No, I'm scared because he will blow up like a bullfrog. Let him blow up like a bullfrog. 
And let him hop out the door and hop to somewhere else because he doesn't want to be warned. He doesn't want to be saved. Let him go. Let her go. We're not in the business of accumulating people. We are in the business of saving people. Accumulating people and saving people is two different uh, uh, subjects. Let me give you an example again. Many years ago, I think it's 93, 94, I was a youth leader somewhere in a church. There was this young man, the Sunday evening we had a service, and this young man, that evening, he was actually my nephew's son. He gave his life to Jesus Christ that Sunday evening. Listen to me, I want to, I want to, I want to show you something of obedience and disobedience. That evening, that young boy, he was 18 years old, gave his life to Jesus Christ. Monday morning, 7 o'clock, he was lying in the mall. He died in a motorbike accident. 7 o'clock. The next morning, he was dead. He was with Christ. Did he just not listen and obey when the Holy Spirit spoke to him? He would have been lost. How many of us can say that next Sunday we will sit here? How many of us is guaranteed that tomorrow morning we will open our eyes and go to work? How many of us? And we think we can play games. You see, when you have to stand before the Father, you will quickly find out game play didn't work. This is a serious business. For those of you who know me, you know I can make jokes. I can be a hana hana. I can hana. But when it comes to this, I can be as serious as I can be. Because you know what? I want to see you in heaven. I want you to be saved. I don't want you to be lost forever and ever and ever forever. Never to find peace in your heart ever in your life again. And today you can sit and watch me. And you can, ha, ha, ha. What does he know? Yes, you can do that. And you don't just know that you're also in the Bible. The Bible says there will be spotters. What's a spotter? Um, uh, huh? Scoffers is the word. There will be scoffers in the last day. Guess what? You were there. So you, you're just fulfilling the prophecies. It's okay. You don't harm me. But one day, when you have to stand before the Father, this message of today will be played back for you. And it will ring in your ears that you had the opportunity. But you never used it. Never used it. This morning I want to tell you that your, 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 your decisions that you're making every single day of your life, even at your job, wherever you are, your decisions that you're making has got consequences. Either positive or negative. But your, your decisions have got consequences. And if you decide against my Lord, you are deciding against yourself. With all due respect to my father, and to respect to everyone who's sitting here who's, and who's, who's watching us on the internet, I just got some news for you. Let me tell you something. God does not need you and me. We need Him. He's already in eternal life. We need to get there. And whatever you choices you can make, whatever decisions you are making, even if you think nobody knows about it, guess what? He knows. <laughs> All of those dark, secret things that we do behind people's back, and especially behind your pastor's back. He's most, he's most blind. He doesn't know anything. Praise God, I don't know everything. You can fool me, but you can't fool him. You cannot toy with my, with my father's spirit because his spirit is omnipresent. You know what omnipresent means? He's everywhere. There's not one thing of your life that he doesn't know. The Bible describes it this. He says, even the amount of hair you have on your head is counted. 
There's not one mossy that fell on this earth that God doesn't know about it. There's not one star that's coming out of his place that, he, that God doesn't know it. You know what? That star falls because, because my God commanded it to go. Because none of the, 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 the creation moves until God speaks. Nothing. But you and I think we've got the ability to tell him, no, I will not serve you. It's okay for now. You can do so. But there will be coming a day of accountability and then you need to have your your ducks in a row then you have to have your excuses in a row you need to have whatever you have in line because i can tell you now none of it will happen it will work let's close our eyes i want you to quickly to think back in your life Of every time that you disobeyed the Holy Spirit. That you quiet down the voice of the Holy Spirit and say to him, it's not time for you now to speak. You don't want to allow him to teach you, to minister to you. You don't want to allow him to give you instruction. How many times did he give you instruction? You tell him, no Lord, I'm not able, I can't, I'm not equipped. You see, God is in the business of saving people. And he needs you and me to do His work. Because we are His hands and His feet in this world. And if you cannot be His hands and His feet. You see, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, If you were warm, or if you were cold, but now that you look warm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Don't think God's love or the fact that He is love that He will tolerate and keep tolerating our sin. He will not keep on tolerating our disobedience because there will be some day, there will be happening, this day will happen that He will close the door. And church is speaking to you today, the people of Christ, the people who says, who's, 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 who's uh, con, con, confessing with their mouths that I am saved. That I have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and I, am, I became the son and the daughter of the Most High. I'm talking to you this morning. The things go wrong in our life and we want to blame Satan. And it's not Satan. It's because of your and my decisions in this world. And God is causing our world to fall apart to bring us back to the beginning of His will. Because that's where He wants you. To obey His will. To submit under His will. To submit under His authority. Don't blame Satan. I want to give you the opportunity this morning to be like Jonah. And I want, to be, I want you to see this morning as the moment that they throw Jonah overboard. And if you say, Lord, I'm guilty. I need to be thrown overboard because I was in disobedience. I need to follow Christ and I need to follow and obey His word and His voice and His spirit. But I've caused situations because of my guilt. I have caused my decisions. I have caused situations in my life for me, my family. And nobody understands it, but I'm the guilty party. And I need to be overthrown, uh, thrown overboard. If you want to do that deed this morning and say, Lord, I'm jumping because I need you to save me. I need you to bring me back to your will. Because I went out of your will. I want you to stand right where you are. Right where you are. Stand. The rest, please, don't, don't, it's not time to watch who's guilty and who's not. If you can't see the own guilt in your own life, please just close. Keep your eyes closed. Don't look around. There's just no time to look around. There's just no time to look around. For these people, it's serious. You might not understand it for various reasons.
Where you stand this morning, I need you to acknowledge to Him where you went wrong. Speak to Him. Tell Him. It's, not, it's got nothing to do with anybody around you. It's a matter between you and Him. You went out of His will, not out of someone else's will. Speak to Him. Tell Him, Lord, sorry. I went out of Your will here, there. Knowledge, repent, and seek His face. So when you jump this morning overboard, tell Him, cry to Him, say, Lord, save me. Save me from myself. Save me from my own life, my own decisions, my own wrong, my own guilt. Save me. I need you to save me. I need you to save me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your voice. That didn't grow cold, didn't grow quiet. Thank you, Jesus, for speaking to us. If you can acknowledge this morning where you went wrong, I want to tell you, you're a man and a woman with backbone that can say, Lord, Lord I'm sorry. Sorry, I went wrong. I made a mistake. Father, each one who's standing before you this morning, they call themselves Jonah this morning. They say, Lord, I made a mistake. I was disobedient. When your spirit and your voice spoke to me, I choose to do the other side. I choose to do the other thing. I choose to do my own will. For that, we are sorry. We acknowledge the fact that we made a mistake, Lord. We, we sinned. We disobey your word and your spirit. But this morning, Lord, we want to be like Jonah and say, Lord, let the circumstances and everything just calm down because we are willing to jump overboard. Say, Lord, we are guilty. Forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us. Wash us. Cleanse us. Deliver us. Set us free. But Lord, when we jump overboard this morning, we want to jump into your hands and we want to cry out and say, Lord, save us. Lord, save us. Just save us bring us back to your will bring us back to the moment that where we went off your will and we we left your will and we we took a side road and a turn off forgive us our ignorance our arrogance We are yielding. We are yielding to your will. We are yielding to your purpose. We are yielding to the voice of the Spirit of God. We are yielding our life unto you completely, Lord. From now, Lord, we ask that we will be led by your Spirit and that we will not act, move, or deviate without the, the Holy Spirit leading us in those directions. Bring us to that place, Lord Jesus, where we are completely handed over under your authority, under your will, under your guidance. This morning we ask, Lord Jesus, that the Holy Spirit will take complete control of our lives, our situations, our circumstances. Even the, the, the choices that we made, 
that was wrong. The choices that we made, either we were misled, misinformed, doesn't matter what reason, but Lord, we ask that you will take control over all. Over all. In Jesus' name. King David, Lord, prayed after he sinned and you ask him, Lord, what punishment does he want? His reply was, let me fall into the mighty hand of God. Implying, may God decide for me. Therefore, Lord, we pray, as we hand our lives over to you, may you, may you decide, may you plan, and may you do your will in our lives. We are asking the Holy Spirit, Lord, to be the ruler, the guide, and the teacher of our lives. And we ask that you will open our ears wide, our spiritually ears, that we can hear the voice of God when He says, go left, go right. That we will not be disobeying his voice or command ever again. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity of returning back. Thank you that we can return unto the will of the Father once again. We ask this morning, Lord, let your will be done in our lives. We bless you and we honor you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praises. May our lives be a witness, a testimony unto everyone out there, even the church, how you restore us. And we thank you for your grace upon our lives. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.